movement grew is there any hope and the good news is that yes there is because today the knowledge base the tools the technology has improved a lot compared to what you had in the 50s or 60s so let's see how the new technology can help us contemporary iwrm means integrated water resources management so the global mind means how the global thinking is changing today we talk about sustainability development goals sdgs pakistan is a signatory today the whole world has agreed that the next round of progress that we should undertake should be sustainable because so far what we have done is not sustainable because by solving one problem you create more problems and those problems remain and the solution ultimately vanishes so the first thing is that we think of free flow let the rivers flow don't dam them don't divert them that's the contemporary school of thought it says the water belongs to no one but to the river where it flows and as it flows water which is flowing in indus river does not belong to pakistan does not belong to india it belongs to the river whether that river is in pakistan or it is in india when we talk of indus delta it is the river delta it is not delta of sind or district badin or district thatta it is the delta of the river a river starts from the mountains and ends up on a delta that's the morphology of every river in the world you cannot cut one limb of a system and then you say it's okay nobody wants to cut one of his legs then we have to understand that there are linkages everything is linked with every other thing in the nature those linkages within the river system within its ecology within within its morphology those links are complicated and interconnected and very strong we do not understand them we still do not have despite all the current knowledge and everything we still do not understand but we should understand just one thing that there are linkages and they should not be disrupted so from an environment of total ignorance where we didn't know that we don't know we are coming into an age of informed ignorance where we say we know that we don't know and that's what we must take care and finally we say go with the flow which means free flow for all and this is a conceptual matrix where we want to be sustainable we don't want to be unsustainable and here is a conceptual here is free flow and here is full structural control we have to lessen it up and get closer to free flow here is full adaptation and here is no adaptation so we should go towards adaptation and we should go towards free flow we want to live in this part of the world and not this einstein once put it he said all our knowledge when measured against reality is primitive and childlike and yet it is the most important asset that we have we are very lucky living in this age because today the knowledge base that is stored with humanity is the biggest knowledge base that had ever been it is not perfect it is not complete yet it is the it is much bigger than what we had before and this knowledge base has multiplied several folds between 1960 and now why i am referring to 1960 is because all of us sitting here can actually see the demonstration of the technologies which were built in 1960s your telephone of 1960s you can still see old movies with those dialing telephones why you say dialing a number because there used to be a dial on the phone it was a rounded thing now you punch it but you don't call it punching the number you call it dialing the number you take any technology from the 60s television motor car aeroplane everything has completely transformed dams were the things of 1960s 
the biggest boom the world had seen of dam construction was between 1930 and 1970s. After 1970s, like from 80s onwards, the trend changed. And one of the pioneers of changing trends was uh, Norwegian Prime Minister. She was a very accomplished lady, uh, Gro Bertrand. Gro Bertrand wrote a report based on which, in 1990s, this Kyoto Protocol was signed, where all the countries all over the world, they came together and they realized that destruction of the environmental systems, the way nature had made it, was not the best thing to do. And if we look at our religious testaments, Quran, this thing was told to us 1400 years ago. There's an ayah in uh, Quran, Surah Hijr, I think ayah number 22. It says that we send rain. We send water through rain. I, I'm, I'm not sorry, I'm not doing the exact translation. It's just the uh, what's in my mind. I'm, I'm just explaining it. But but this ayah is something like this: that we that we send loaded air. Loaded means loaded with moisture, and that brings you rain and brings you water, so that you drink it and you, your animals drink it. And the next line of the ayah is that you are not the holders of the storage. Now, once you try to become the holders of the storage, you want to take that thing away from God and away from nature and you say, okay, I will create the storage and I will distribute water. That's going against God. That's going against your Holy Testament. That's going against the teachings of your religion. And the science and the world has learned it through mistakes that this was the wrong thing to do. In America these days, they are dismantling their dams. In last 15 years alone, they have dismantled more than 1,500 dams. 1,500 is not a small number for 10 years, so, so, so for 12 years. It's the last 12 years. And if you can actually Google search dam dismantling and you will end up at a site. Uh, there will be so many links, but then there's a one authenticated link which is basically uh, American Waters or something like that. And it has the complete inventory of all the dams which have been dismantled. And there are studies going on of dismantling every single dam that they have. They may dismantle these dams, some of these dams maybe 50 years from now or maybe 100 years from now, but the dismantling of dams is on the drawing board right now. So, we are very lucky that our religion actually converges with science. It does not diverge. And the things that we did not understand yesterday, we understand them today. And when I say possibilities and way forward, the bottom line says science, research, and emerging technologies. So what do we have today that is possible in Pakistan? When I say possibilities, it means possibilities for our country. Within our own capacity, within the capacity of our technical people, within the capacity of our financial institutions, within the capacity of our culture to accept it. So these are a few things that I will now be talking about. First of all, I will take on the urban sector. By the way, the distribution of water between urban sector and rural or irrigation sector is widely different in terms of water volume. 95% of our water is used in irrigation sector and only 5% is in the urban sector. But that 5% is mostly drinking water and potable water, which is used for health and hygiene. So that water, though small in percentage, is very important. And if it is not managed properly, there are so many problems. This is that ayah. So here is the complete reference. You can read the lines. And yes, it is Surah Hijr, number 15 Surah and 22nd ayah.
So the bottom line from this teaching is do not pollute rainwater because God has sent it for drinking. I will start or, or I will just give an example of one of the urban areas. If you look at this, you can read this word Quran and this blue thing over here is a lake, it's an artificial lake, this is Rawal Dam and this area is basically the watershed of Rawalpindi and Islamabad region and in between this is the main river which is Sawan, this is Korang river, this is Ling river and this is Lai Nala. If you look at this map, God created all these flow paths as freshwater streams. You talk to somebody who is an old timer living in Rawalpindi for a long time, that person will tell you that there used to be game fish in Nala Lai. People used to catch fish from the from that uh, stream. It was a freshwater stream, and you all, almost all of you know what we did with it. There is a machine that works for us. That machine is basically the system of water that comes and brings water to the area. And this is the data, starting from 1900 all the way to 2016. Last dot is 2016. This is the total annual rainfall in this watershed which I showed you in the previous slide. And if you put a trend line in it, actually the rainfall is increasing. It's an increasing trend. And why it is increasing? It's not against science. It is actually very much familiar with science. We are talking about climate change and global warming. I also have data which I'm not, I have not prepared a slide of that, but we also have data on temperature. The temperature in the last 100 years in this area has gone up by one degree. And the hydrological system is energized by the air temperature and sunlight. And the more the energy in air, the more moisture it can hold. And the more moisture means heavier clouds and heavier cloud means heavier rain. So it is perfectly in line with the data and this is what we see that the rainfall has increased a little bit in the past 100 years. So if somebody is telling you that rainfall is getting lesser in this area, please re-look at this data. This line, this is the 10 years average. Every point on this line is average of 5 years in the past and 5 years in the future from this point. So this is how this line is going. And here you can very clearly see that it's a pretty constant type of a wave, a pretty regular wave in hydrological terms. And there is always a rise and a fall in every 10 years. And this probably links with the solar cycles because there's a rise and fall in the total solar temperature over a period of 11 years. There's a name for that solar cycle, I don't remember that one. But it almost assigns with that. Now, if somebody says that when I used to go to school, there used to be more rain, those were the times he was going to school. And now, now I go to work and there's less rain, maybe he's here. And another thing about past is that in the past, I remember for myself, and most of you would remember, that we used to interact with the nature more than we do today. Today we get out of the house, sit in a car or in a Suzuki Daba and go to school. And if it's raining, you don't get wet. In our times, we have to walk to, walk to the school. So every rainfall, every shower, we felt it and we remember it. Today, there are so many showers that happen and you don't interact. You are sitting inside, playing with WhatsApp and stuff. So that's the change of lifestyle that has moved us away from the nature. But outside, the nature is working the same way that it was working before. Here is the average of the same data for past 100 years. This is, these are the monthly averages. So what you see is, you get a little bit more rain in uh, February, March, and then you get a lot more rains in July, August. So that's the rainfall pattern of this area. If we are planning to provide water to every citizen of this watershed at a rate of 135, uh, sorry, at a rate of 35 gallons per person per day, which is a pretty much accepted worldwide standard, 
all we need is about 0.7 billion cubic meters of water. This is the population. This is how the population is increasing and this is today's population. And with this, this is the demand for 35 persons per person per day and this demand is written here in million gallons per day. We require about a little more than 500 million gallons per day to serve today's population. And if we look at how much is manageable, how much we can manage for the future. Now this is the water that we receive and in this, if I draw a line here, then this is 348 million gallons per day and this much can take care of 361 million gallons per day. You add them together, simply they are more than 700. Your demand is about 500. So if you forget about all the rains and you just think of managing this water, which is the monsoons, only just gear up for two months and keep that water somewhere then you are good to go. There is no water shortage in this part of the world. Now what we are doing, we are developing this area. This red thing is basically human footprint on the area. And this is what we are doing with this one. We are polluting our water. Those freshwater streams which were meant to provide you life and drinking water, you are polluting them with all the developments, whether it's Islamabad or Baradou or Vasa or Kentbor or DHA or Berga Town or Askri or DHA too. Every single development is creating a system of pollution which is going into your streams and into your subsurface aquifers. This is what it looks like on the surface. Gigo room, garbage in, garbage out. This is we call development. This is one of the areas in that watershed where Beria Town is built. But this is 2005. And this is what it looks like. Not much of human footprint you can see in this picture. But if you go to 2007, it looks like this. This is, this is what we call development. Beria Town and DHAs are coming up in this area. And 2018, we have built those expensive houses and stuff. And you see, this is Savan River, which is passing by. And this is a picture. You see those trees and this cutting. And on top of that ridge is one of the most expensive locations of Pania Town. And down here, you see grasses. And between these grasses, ahead of these grasses, you can see garbage. And between this, these grasses and garbage is Savan River. So this is how this expensive community is managing its waste, dumping it right into the river. This river is the water which is sent to you by God for drinking. Soon, the Sawan River would look like this. Now this is how God made it. This is your watershed. Now it's the same area but in a 3D view. These are your rivers. This is human footprint. And there is a very interesting thing in this area, geologically speaking. Why Sawa River is here? And by the way, Sawa River is also a very old river. This is a very interesting geological point on Sawa River. This is a ridge line which has been cut leveled by the river. Again, Sawa River is a tributary of Indus. It is older than these mountains. It is older than Murray Hills. And this ridge was, when it was growing, the river was cutting it. The ridge has grown, but river did not leave its course. So again, this is a very robust river. So we should be aware of this thing, that the system of water provision in this area is still very robust. And then, this black line, this is a sink line. Sink line is basically the dipping formations underneath your ground. And when the dip is like this, it is called a sink line. Which means the layering is basically like this and they are converging. So all the water which is absorbed in ground ultimately is caught up in those layers and those layers push it at one point and ultimately when it, the whole formation is filled up, 
it starts oozing on ground and where it starts oozing it has made this river so this is how this river is made some river is always flowing whether it's rain or no rain whether it's snow melt or no snow melt why it is flowing because the water which gets absorbed in the formations ultimately comes and seeps back on the surface and the water which say went inside 100 years ago maybe today it is seeping out that's how the ground water moves that's that's the kind of time scale the ground water has and all the ground water is ultimately converging into these streams and into some other and these are the imported ideas and imported gifts now instead of telling us how to manage our waters they say hey uh, this summer uh, this this lai nala is a flood hazard so they put an instrument instrument station over here with some complicated gadgetry and uh, sensors and they would tell the wasa that now the river is flooding so just get away and all the dumping of garbage all along nala lai is still taking place here and they say just keep cleaning it so that the water keep rushing out now here is another urban stream this one is still nala lai you can see some donkeys here this bridge and all this garbage and stuff this is another urban stream you can see big buildings here bridge and then urban stream and it's like a picnic spot although in concrete but still this is an urban stream in south korea the name of the stream is chingi chong i visited this stream and i spoke about it on uh, fm 99 this video is still available on youtube courtesy of najib saab who is here his channel actually interviewed me and i talked about this stream that how other countries which have not even read quran are now managing their urban streams and how we are doing it and because it was broadcast it is still available on youtube mr moody went to see it now this is shame i spoke for pakistani people for pakistani decision makers and this idiot he was there shaking hand with this guy standing on chingi chong street <laughs> I I wish I can find out an idiot here but there ain't no idiot people there are wise people here they know what not to do